today, Joshua chapter 9, and if you saw the sermon title on the screen, I've entitled it The Gibeonite Dilemma. And so to give you a little bit of background, this is of course a time when the Israelites had crossed the Jordan River into the promised land of Canaan. And remember there was a Christophany, when they crossed over, who did they see? The captain of the Lord of hosts with a sword drawn in his hand. And they were told to possess the land that they were given. Now let me just pause there because this is something that's extremely important. They were told to possess it. They said it would be given to them. It was promised to them. But they had to possess it. Possess means to take ownership of. You see, if they had the idea that they were just going to waltz into Canaan and everything was going to be given to them, they were sadly mistaken. They were going to have to battle. And that is a picture of you and I battling in the Christian life. A misnomer, a disservice, and quite honestly, a lie that perhaps is told to somebody who's a new convert or maybe considering Christ, is that, welcome to the kingdom. Everything's great. Pomegranates, leeks, onions. No, that's not the case at all. Yes, you now have assurance of eternal life. Yes, God is good all the time. Yes, he will give you peace and joy and love. Nothing else is able to do. But make no mistake about it, you will battle in this life if you are truly part of that army of God. You will battle. You will battle the sin. You will battle the flesh. You will battle Satan. You will battle the world, the fallen world that you live in. And so with that being said, they battled to possess it. The instructions given in Deuteronomy were to wipe all the other inhabitants out, not to make a league or a covenant with any other people. They were instructed to destroy all the places where the other nations served other gods, Deuteronomy. Again, chapter 20, verses 16 through 18. And so, let me bring you up to speed more specifically. Right before the Gibeonites come on the scene, there was a victory. The first battle is Jericho. You all know. You learn it in Sunday school when you're a kid, marching around the walls of Jericho, and they're instructed to do that, and they blow a trumpet, and the walls fall down, and the victory is given to Jericho. Well, what happens after the victory of Jericho? Fame starts to spread about the Lord, about Joshua, about the Israelites. And then they have a battle at Ai. And there was a pothole, a blip in the road, because someone internally had done something forbidden. They had taken a Babylonian garment and some shekels of gold and silver, this man was called Achan, and he took it, and it caused 36 men to die on the battlefield. And so that was dealt with very, very sternly, let's say. We'll allude to that. We'll get to that later on. So Jericho and Ai are behind the Israelites, and now they continue marching, moving into this land to possess it. And here comes the Gibeonites. So let's pick up in Joshua chapter 9. Verse 1, after we pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, extract all the meat and the milk out of this text for your people today. Feed them. Lord, instruct them in righteousness. Convict, Holy Spirit, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Help your vessel to be sanctified. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, and all of God's family said, thank you. And it came to pass when all the kings, verse 1 of Joshua chapter 9, it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side of Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof. Verse 2. So verses 1 through 6, we'll talk about the approach and the strategy of the Gibeonites. Verses 7 through 13, the Gibeonites meeting with the Israelites, their encounter. Verses 14 through 19, the error of the Israelites 
leaders and the sparing of the Gibeonites, and then we'll end very beautifully with verses 20 through 27 with the mercy of God. So all these people gathered themselves together, verse 2, to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. So they made a league, an alliance. They heard about the victories, heard about Jericho, Ai, so they made a plan. So let's all merge together. Hey, there's strength in numbers. We need to fight against this new inhabitant, the Israelites, because they were instructed to wipe us all out. Verse 3, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work willily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, representatives. So what are they doing? Two things I want to pause. You cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. The first tactic was power and numbers come together to fight against God's people. But this strategy is different. The Gibeonites who were located a few hours by foot north of Jerusalem came up with a different plan. They said, let's pretend somebody that we're somebody that we're not. Let's put a mask on. Let's deceive. Let's lie. So, they pretend they're ambassadors. Verse 4, second part. They took old sacks upon their asses or camels and wine bottles, old and rent or torn and bound up, and old shoes, verse 5, and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. So here's the picture of these Gibeonites. Their plan involves dressing up, pretending what is old is new, bringing provisions, and they're going to go out and intentionally meet the Israelites. They went to Joshua, this is verse 6, and they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We become from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. Now league, berith, in Hebrew is the same word, league and covenant. Depending on the translation you're reading, make a covenant, make a league with us. Now let me pause there and just say, it's very, very important who you make a league with or who you make a covenant with in life. I would start at the top. The first league or covenant that needs to be made is between you and Jesus Christ. That's why we took the bread and the cup this morning, to remember that covenant, to remember that promise, that sacrifice. That's right at the very top. Secondly, marriage. Who you yoke with, who you make that covenant with, affects the remainder of your life. Thirdly, other family members and friends, colleagues. Who are you joining with? Because bad company does corrupt good manners. Jesus said, what fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship does Satan have with Belial? The answer is none. It says in Amos, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? They can't. So who you join with in ministry, who you join with in any capacity, will affect you for sure. And what you're going to see is a mistake. A mistake made by Joshua and the Israelites. Verse 7. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, that's the Gibeonites, peradventure, perhaps you dwell among us. How shall we make a league with you? Good question to, to start. They're kind of saying, hey, maybe you actually live here within Canaan. How are we going to make a league with you? We can't do that. And they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. Joshua said unto them, Who are you and from where you come from? That's a good first question. That's a good surface question to begin with. Well, tell us about it. Where are you from? What do you do? That's a good question. And listen to how the Gibeonites respond. They said unto him, From a very far country, Thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did, verse 10, to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtoreth. So they've heard. So what is the tactic being used here as they're lying? 
not about hearing what the Israelites did, but lying about who they are and what they're going to bring and where they actually dwell, one of the tactics here is flattery. Joshua 6, 27 says this, After the battle of Jericho, so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. A very dangerous position to be in. It always concerns me when I hear about the power pastor. It always concerns me. Because that man is in a very dangerous position. When the man is exalted, him, all his congregation, his ministry is put in grave danger. Why? Because flattery will ruin. Flattery, not encouragement, flattery will destroy a church, will destroy a ministry, and even destroy a marriage. Do you know the whorish woman talked about in Proverbs 6? Do you know how she deceives the man? It says with her smooth speech. With her smooth speech. Why? Because that plays to men. That plays to their ego. That plays to their pride, you see. So you always have to guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life, the Proverbs say. And so Joshua's starting to believe the press a little bit. Joshua's starting to believe how great he is. Although it's God that's giving the victories, even if he's acting as though God is being given all the glory, perhaps there's just a little glimmer here of susceptibility. Susceptibility to flattery, and pride. Now listen, verse 11, Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals or food with you to the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make a league with us. This our bread we took hot, these are all lies, for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry, it's moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent or torn. And these are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. Here's the pivotal verse in Joshua 9. Here's the big mistake. And the men took of their victuals, and before I continue with that, flesh. There's another pitfall. Flesh. We have food, we have drink. We hear about how great you are. And you got to understand, in that day, as I said before, it's not like they could just go to Wegmans or Tops or all these and get them. No, 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 no. Food was valued. Wine, bread, sustenance, which maybe they didn't always have, especially on the battlefield. And now, here you go, we have this. I'm sorry, it was hot. No, it wasn't. It was fresh. It never was. But see, they fall to flattery and they fall to flesh because they have an inability to control their fleshly appetites. That is another pitfall of men and women in ministry, in family, in relationship. Susceptibility to flattery, inability to control fleshly appetites. And so, verse 14, the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. There is no bigger mistake you can make in battle than not asking counsel of the captain of the Lord of hosts. You've probably heard me say this before, patience pays. I have found personally when I'm patient in decision making, it usually works out well. When I'm not, it doesn't. Isaac and Ishmael, one is a long-awaited promised child, the other is a flesh-driven reaction. An impatient decision. And God in his mercy said, I'll make Ishmael still, he's going to be a great nation. But he was never my chosen son. He wasn't the promised child. And these leaders, perhaps because of some victories, all of a sudden start to put their guard down. And this tactic works. Hey, we're ambassadors. We come from a far country. No, we don't live amongst you. We just want to bless you with bread and wine. And we heard how great you are. And all of a sudden, pitfall. Pitfall. And you always have to guard against that. You need discernment. You need the spirit of counsel and of wisdom when you meet with people, when you consider engaging in business with them, when you consider engaging in ministry with them. You need the spirit of counsel and wisdom, and you need the fruit of patience. 
Never rush into a decision when making a covenant or a league with someone. Never. Because once you do, it's very hard to get out of it. It's very hard. There'll be fractured relationships. There'll be injured feelings. Very difficult. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Verse 15, And Joshua made peace with them, and he made a league with them to, to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swore unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwell amongst them. The lie comes out. The truth will always come out. Time and truth go together. It will always come out who you really are, who you really serve, where you're really from. It will always come out. I don't say that. I say this in love to all of you. In love to all of you. And I put myself right in the middle of it. Christians, those who name the name of Christ, put on their best Gibeonite mask this time on Sunday mornings. That's something I've learned. So how do you combat that? You take time. You take time to get to know them. You take time. And you wait for the truth to come out. If you think that every person that passes into a church congregation, sanctuary, auditorium, whatever you want to call it, on Sunday morning is saved, you know not the word of God. This is not the case. And some come in as Gibeonites, pretending to be somebody they're not. So it's very important that the leaders of a church, it's very important that the presidents, the leaders of a company, the head of the family, the father, the mother, use discernment and counsel to determine if that yoking covenant league is wise or unwise. Who are these people? Verse 17. And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chepra, Beroth, and kirjath Jerem. The children of Israel smote them not, meaning did not kill them, because the princes or leaders of the congregation had sworn unto them, by the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation murmured against the princes. Can I tell you something that's appropriate murmuring? Just like they mo murmured against Moses. Moses was unjust. This was just, because you have to understand something. If you want to be in the battlefield, if you want to be in the ministry, get ready to take some hits. Get ready to be backbitten, talked against, turned against, lied about, it's part of it. It's part of it. Chuck Swindoll said this, to be in the ministry, you need to have the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the skin of a hippo. If you get easily offended, let me give you this with a sincere heart, don't join the ministry. Please don't get involved in any aspect of ministry. If you are easily offended, please do not join yourself to any ministry because what is promised by God is this. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. Did you hear what Barry said? That was a reminder, loving your enemies, to put coals upon their head. That doesn't mean burn them in your flesh. It means help those that hate you get food by giving them coals to make the food back in that day. You see, the true test of a man of God, a woman of God, can you do these things? Can you love your enemies? When they murmur against you, leadership Healthy conflict is unavoidable. Absolutely unavoidable. I could tell you this as a father. I could tell you this as a husband. I could tell you this as a pastor. I could tell you this as an evangelist. I could tell you this as a business owner. Healthy conflict is unavoidable. And if you avoid it, please don't get involved in any type of covenant or league with anyone else. Because it won't work out. Prepare to battle. It's a battle. The Christian life is a battle. And you do lose sometimes. But remember, the war is over. We have the victory long term. But you're going to battle while you're here. You're going to battle for the souls of your children. You're going to battle for your marriage. You're going to battle for your ministry. You are going to have to battle with a sword drawn in your hand. You are going to have to battle by denying your fleshly appetite once in a while, by seeking God's face, by praying and fasting, and seeking God's face for the spirit of wisdom and counsel so you can make those good decisions. This is what it means 
This is what it means to possess the land that God has given you. He's given you eternal life, but you know it's not best life now. That's not what it is. That's why I tell you, people that think it's best life now, prosperity gospel is straight from the pit of hell. It's a Gibeonite gospel. It's not the real gospel. Best life now is not the good news of Jesus Christ. That is a lie to lull you into sleep and lose 36 men on the battlefield because you're seeking after a Babylonian garment and shekels of gold and silver. Your priorities are not in order. And let me tell you this, and this is a bold statement My wife is not here today, and I love her more than anybody on this earth, and I include my kids in that. And let me tell you this. She might watch this later, and she knows I love her. I'm just going to be honest. I put this in the newsletter of Rescue and Revive. Sometimes the greatest gifts, the greatest gifts God himself gives to you horizontally will be your biggest obstacles vertically. Because in the end, guess who you stand before God with? No one. No one. You will not be there with your wife. You will not be there with your husband. You will not be there with your children. You will not be there with your degree, your diploma, your bank account. You will stand before God accountable for what you've done and you've said. No one else. No one else. You serve him and him alone. They murmured against The princes, I've already told you, the leaders will get blamed. 1 Timothy, Titus, requirements for church leadership. You'll be put before the firing squad. It always goes back to the leaders. Remember Moses? Remember Saul? How about Achan? What happened to Achan? Listen to this. If you really believe, if you literally believe the word of God, which I do, if you literally believe the word of God, here was the consequence for that internal sin. The consequence was this. When Achan finally confessed his sin, it cost 36 men their lives. He said, okay. Joshua said, I want you to come forward. You, all your cattle, all your family. And they burned them and they stoned them at the Valley of Achor. The Valley of Trouble, it's called. See, that's very serious. Sometimes people accuse me of being too serious. Do you know why I'm serious? Because I have lives on the line. I have people I'm responsible for. That's why I'm serious in battle. There's a time to joke. Whether they believe me or not, I like to laugh. And you'd probably be surprised behind closed doors how much I probably joke too much. But when it comes time to go to battle, you better have a sober-mindedness. You better be fixated on the things of God. Or else people are going to get hurt. People are going to lose their lives, and they're under your care. As a leader in God's army, local church, ministry, doesn't matter what it is, it's a very serious situation. And so... Verse 19, but all the princes said unto all the congregation, we have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. See, they made a covenant. And back then, you make a covenant. We talked about this weeks ago. You cannot break it. It's before God. Cannot break that holy covenant. You made it before God. How many people are breaking the covenant of marriage they made before God? Why? Because they were offended? I got news for you. Marriage is going to offend you at times. Your spouse is going to offend you at times. They're going to make you upset. They're going to make you angry. You don't just check out. That's not a covenant. That's a copycat. That's a Gibeonite way. You stay in the heat of the battle. You pray for your spouse. You fast for your spouse. You pray with your spouse. You take the insult if it's unwarranted. You are slow to speak and quick to listen and slow to wrath. Why? Because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. You stay in the battle. We have too many quitter Christians today. They quit on everything. Quit their marriage, quit their family, quit their job. That is not steadfastness. That is not the heart of God, the will of God, nor the word of God. Don't worry, we're going to get to the mercy. We're coming up right now. It's going to soften up a little bit. Here it is. Verse 20. This we will do to them. We will even let them live. 
lest wrath or anger be upon us because of the oath which we swear unto them. And the princes said unto them, let them live, the leaders. But let them be hewers or cutters of wood and pourers or servants of water unto all the congregation as the princes had promised them. So said, okay, let's do this. See, it's plan B. It's a pivot. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. They made an oath, they can't go back. They made a mistake, they got to take ownership of it. Leadership, you take ownership of your mistakes. You take ownership of your mistakes in marriage, as a family man, as a business man, as a minister, you take ownership. You say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. What can we do to turn this around? And the Israelites, the leaders say, okay, let's make them servants. Woodcutters, water pourers. There's a picture here coming. There's a picture. There's a picture of mercy. The Gibeonites do not deserve the mercy of God. They were instructed. They were told to be wiped out. But you see God's mercy here. Joshua, Jehovah is salvation. That's what his name means. Who who crossed over? Joshua and Caleb. Only Christ and his church are part of Canaan, the new birth, the new life in Christ. He says, okay, we'll let you live. We'll make you servants. So you and I are when we come to know Jesus Christ. We're servants. The water of the new birth, the sin washed away, a revelation and a realization of who you are and then who Christ is at the cross, the wood. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Therefore, Christ did for you and me. And he says, Joshua called for them. He spake unto them, saying, Why have you beguiled us, saying, We are very, very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed. There shall be none of you be freed from being bondmen and hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore, we were sore afraid. We were very afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. You see, that's a good thing. The Gibeonites had a fear of the Lord. Missing in the church is a fear of the Lord. There is no fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. We just hear about the Jesus loves you. That's the God we hear about. Jesus loves you. Yes, he does. The Bible tells me so. But what about this God? What about this God that told Joshua, because of this sin, take them out and put them out and stone them and burn them because of this sin that cost us 36 lives because they did not obey the command of God? It's very serious. There's no fear of the Lord. Jesus Christ Almighty is not Santa Claus. He's not a genie. He's not just a teacher, a prophet, an apostle. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He will destroy the earth the second time with fire, with fervent heat. He flooded it the first time. This is the God we serve. You say, well, how are we going to tell people about that? Very simple. Tell them both. Tell them about the judgment, the wrath of God that is upon them unless they turn to the mercy and grace of God which is presented to them. See, is it this service when you just talk about Jesus loves you? Yes, I love it. It's so beautiful. The love of God. God is love. Okay, yeah, we'll take the prize. That sounds great. And I'll just go out living like a Gibeonite. But did you forget to say, did you forget that God shall not be mocked? Did you forget that this is a God who says, depart from me, I never knew you. You had no oil in your lamp. You pretended to be somebody you're not. You came as an ambassador. You came as an angel of light. You are not my child. Did you forget? Some people need to be plucked out of the fire, my friend. And I'll share this with you as I end. I'm praying about that spend support outreach it's a little intimidating, I'll tell you why. Because the city, you can go out and blast things out. It says this in Judges. I was reading Judges. That's just my personal time. It says this, when they went in to take the land, the inhabitants, in Judges, it says, 
They got the victory in the mountains, but not in the valleys, because in the valleys, the people had iron chariots. And the Lord just spoke to my heart. The Holy Spirit just ministered to me and, and said, wow, just like, this is going to be just like Spencer Port. The iron chariots of affluency. Affluency is harder to get victory over than desperation. You understand? You see? When you go into battle, you've got to have a plan. You've got to strategize. You've got to seek the Lord. You can't approach everybody the same way. You've got to approach him according to the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. God's word has your sword. Verse 24, and they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded a servant Moses. We read this. They were afraid. Verse 25, and now behold, we're in your hand as it seemeth good and right unto thee to do unto us too. And so we did unto them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel that they slew them not. Mercy. Mercy. Joshua made them hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. The altar of the Lord, a place of sacrifice and death. Even unto this day, in the place which he should choose, you see. Beautiful picture. In the last seven verses, Joshua made a covenant with them, like Jesus does with us. Joshua protects them like God does with us. God gave them a purpose. Oh, it may not be in what man's eyes are, a high and mighty calling. Well, they're not leading the people. They're not speaking before the people. They're not leading worship. They're not blowing the shofar. No, they're servants. They do whatever God's called them to do by his grace and his mercy. It better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Whatever he's called you to do, you do it with all your heart. You see, it's no different whether you're preaching or teaching or cutting wood or serving pitchers of water. It makes no difference. God's called you to do it. You're a servant of the Most High at the altar of the Lord, the place of death. You see, I've said it before. Before there's a resurrection, there has to be a crucifixion. If you have not died, you are not living. If you have not died spiritually, you are not living. You know not about the wood and the water. You haven't come to a revelation of the cross, the work of the cross. You have not been born again. You are simply a Gibeonite. You say, well, how will I know? If you're asking yourself that question, you're probably not saved. How will you know? Transformation. Revelation will produce transformation. Transformation. You will not be the same. Oh, there may be things you struggle with. There'll be battles. But you will not be the same. Caterpillar to butterfly. People look and say, well, what happened? Yeah, what happened? I play golf my couple times a year, a handful of times. You were my old high school guys. I know one of them, 43 years since kindergarten. Last time I played around with them, these guys, they don't swear, they don't say, I don't ask them to do that, by the way. They know how I used to live in my miry clay days. One time a swear word slipped out. Oh, I'm sorry. I said nothing. They just know. They can see it. They can hear it. You live it. Not perfectly. You battle. But you're God's servant. You are God's servant. Chosen child of God in the army of light battling for what matters most battling for what matters most I'll end with this I really will end this time I promise this is the end I was very emotional this morning in my office and I was really Hoping and praying, no one would come in to pray with me today. Usually I want people, I really did, because I, I was just real emotional. Because I realized something, you know. I've talked about this. I had the privilege of giving the eulogy for John Salmon, a friend of mine, a couple weeks ago. And in the newsletter, I wrote down the name of three other 
fallen, two other fallen soldiers, not in the U.S. military, in God's army, that I served alongside with. And now there's another one in the hospital. It's going to go on palliative care. The Lord just started really breaking me. Because once it's over, it's over. Once it's over, it's over. You serve one time. Don't go AWOL. Don't go AWOL. Don't resist the battle. You go in with the Spirit of God with the power of God, the word of God. He'll give you the victory. Not by might, nor by power, saith the Lord, but by my spirit. Same holds true today. We have the victory, and we can get the victories as we battle through this life. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to gather And once again, remember the broken body, the shed blood, the word of God. As a local family, I thank you for what you're doing here, God, and these beautiful people. That's how you look at them. You look at them as beautiful people. Why? Because they receive by faith the suffering of Christ. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And Lord, with that, help us not to forget the power and awe of the God we serve. We don't want anybody to fall in to the hands of God when they pass without knowing him. Not even our worst enemy. And so, Lord, we thank you that by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, we've been given the gift of eternal life. Help us to live according to that truth. In Jesus' name. And all of God's family said amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, Alice.